Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our show. Today, as you can see, an old friend of our show is with us once again, the one and only Father John Bear. Father John, will you say hello to our viewers? It's really good to be with you, Sister Vassa, and the zillions of, of peeps that you've got following you. Really good. <laughs> looking forward to chatting with you very much. As am I. Today, my friends, we are making this video as a promotional video for an upcoming conference at which Father John and also uh, yours truly and several others will be speaking on a topic that today is reflecting and challenging our understanding of what it means to be church. The topic of this upcoming conference, and I will tell you all about it in just one second, the topic of the conference is orthodoxy and war. The topic is occasioned, of course, because of the war in Ukraine and the effects it is having on church and church unity, particularly in the Russian Orthodox and Ukrainian Orthodox spheres, but not only in those church spheres. Now, my friends, if you want to join us either in person, because it is an in-person conference, or you might wanna join us from afar via Zoom, we will put the link in the description to this video or perhaps within the video itself, if my editing team manages to do that, they are challenged, my friends, you know this. We have problems, but we are also very blessed by my slightly dysfunctional team. Um, we will put up all the information for you. The conference is coming up on Pentecost weekend, right before Orthodox Pentecost, on Friday and Saturday, June 10th and 11th, mark your calendars. It's going to take place in Seacliff, New York. That's on Long Island. It's taking place at St. Luke's Episcopal uh, Church. So you can find all the information at the link uh, and you can register. Please do so. It's an important conference. The full title of the conference is Women's Orthodoxy and War Conference because it's being organized by several women. Uh, my friends and I, and uh, we will have topics discussed along with the ecclesiological topic in Father John's talk. He will be reflecting profoundly on what church means. It's called, what is church? So that's a very intriguing thing, a uh, very intriguing question. But the other topics include uh, the uh, a topic that's particularly important for women, but not only. Uh, one of the late motifs of the war in Ukraine, that is rape and the various aspects and language of rape that has been used in this aggression against Ukraine. Uh, there will be a talk on Putinism, Putinism vis-a-vis -vis Christianity. How do they go together or not? Uh, there will be a talk by a famous Russian historian, Tamara Edelman, we'll be talking about uh, the fascist aspects of Putinism, going through what fascism actually means. It's one of these terms that people don't seem to define when they use. Um, there will be a special talk uh, dedicated to the issues of ROKOR, my church, the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, and its relationship with the Moscow Patriarchate, Patriarchate past, present, and future. Questions about this? Uh, then the, also another talk will be exploring the role of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, in general in this war and more. So there will be more and there will be a panel discussion and there will be time for uh, conversation and discussion and uh, sharing of our concerns, our hopes, our heartbreak and so forth. Uh, surrounding this war. Okay, everybody, so do come, uh, anyone who can. I will be there and will be very happy to see you. Uh, my 2022 mug will be for sale there. This 2022 mug, my friends, I, I know many of you already have one, uh, but these will be for sale. Faith over fear every day of the year, it says, and there I am steering a boat no less. So uh, this is a collector's mug because next year we'll have the 2023 mug and you don't want your collection to be incomplete as we 
however long we do these, these annual mugs. You don't want your collection to be incomplete. That's it for the introduction. Now to- oh, I, I should say a couple of words. It sounds like it's going to be a really, really wonderful conference and really congratulations to you, Sister Vassa, on pulling it off and all the other participants and speakers that are going to be there. And especially I'd like to thank you for all that you've done over the past weeks and months and all the postings and videos and reflections that you've done. It's really been such a spiritual benefit for so, so many people. Thank you, Father John. Thank you so much. And you said that well. I gave him the text of that. <laughs> Uh, you, you didn't give me those words. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did that well. It was convincing. It was, and it was from the heart. Everybody, we are now going to begin to discuss uh, fascinating and vital questions connected to uh, what I just said, how this affects our understanding of church. So, Father John, first of all, uh, I want to discuss this phenomenon of people who are very disappointed and perhaps shocked and uh, dismayed at the behavior of certain hierarchs, they are either jumping jurisdictions, looking for a jurisdiction, that means another, I don't know if any of you non-Orthodox out there are not familiar with this word, but we have jurisdictions, and people are sometimes looking to a jurisdiction that has, say, a hierarch who's behaving in a better way or saying at least not totally inappropriate things, you know, something a little bit more uh, uh, acceptable. And people are also simply abstaining from going to church. I know this because people write to me about it uh, and they feel like they can't in good conscience be part of that church that supports this war. So I want you to think aloud for us, uh, what would one, uh, how would one be informing one's church belonging right now and perhaps fortifying oneself uh, in one's sense of being church in the light of this kind of, I would say, crisis? You know, I think one of the, the most important things to reflect on is really what we mean by the word church anyway. I think that for so many of us today, we flattened it out into a very this worldly organization. It, it, it's belonging to this group and we compare ourselves to this group, that group, the jurisdictionism you're talking about. Whereas the word church, uh, you know, for me, studying the early church primarily refers, as Paul speaks about it, to our heavenly mother, in whose, in whose womb we're being born through the whole course of this life, beginning with baptism, continuing by taking up the cross daily, participating in the Eucharist, and all of that. It's in the womb of our heavenly mother, the new Jerusalem, that we're being born into the life of the eighth day, the life of the kingdom to come, um, in that renewed creation. That's what we're anticipating and living into in in the church what we tend to do is to use that word church in so many different ways so that it refers to the institution and we compare one institution with another institution this church versus that church um, and i'm not even talking about non-orthodox i'm just talking about within orthodoxy you know the very question you're dealing with you know how how do i relate to the russian church compared to the Greek church or whatever else it might be. We've reduced it to this, this structure like that. It shouldn't be. It Whereas shouldn't be. So, uh, so says, to... yeah, or the apostle says there in Christ, there is neither. Neither, neither Jew nor Greek. Yeah. I mean, so how can there be a Russian church and a Greek church? It, you know, yes, there has to be organization and coordination and working out how the different communities are going to relate to each other and all of those things. But that 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 um, activity of organizational, institutional, that is not really what church is. It really isn't. Uh, from the earliest times, Christians spoke about their church as their mother. And the referent was not to an administrative body. The referent is to our heavenly mother, bearing us into the life of the new creation. Yeah. So I would want to start on that level by reorientating what it is we think we're talking about when we're talking about church. Am and I understanding some... correctly? First mm -hmm. of all, I will, uh, I'll let you speak once again. So, so far, you have described something that is a process, something that is we're constantly growing into. It's not yeah. a given, 
it's not a given. There is something eschatological about it. There is an eschatological, everybody means uh, the conversation and teaching on the eschaton or the fulfillment. And so to what degree are we already in the fulfillment as church and to what degree are we not there yet? So Father John, could you give us your definition of church, the one that you told me a few weeks ago? Yes. That I, have I, 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 come to that, I would just pick up on what you're saying, just, just develop a little bit further. You know, so the word church, literally in Greek, it means to be called out, yes? But it doesn't mean to be called out of one socio-worldly institution into another amongst others. It means to be called out from this world into the next, from this creation to the new creation, to the renewed creation, and all the different ways one can speak of that. And then we have to realize that the way in which we're called out from this world to be born into the renewed creation is through our death. It's through taking up the cross. It's, it's begun in Christ himself, the firstborn of all creations, begun with him. He's the firstborn of many brethren, the firstborn of the dead, all that language, and we're living into that. And so the question of it being a process, you know, Paul speaks of baptism um, in Romans 6, 5, as being, if you have been baptized into Christ, conformed to his death, past tense, you will also rise future tense. And that, that switch from the past to the future tense is so important. And the reason why he switches is because, yes, although we've been sacramentally baptized once and for all and so on, we're not yet dead. We're, we're still learning how, how to die, how to take up the cross, how to live not for myself, but for my neighbor, and all the ways one can spell that out. We are learning to decrease so that he might increase, but we're not there yet. The moment of transition is, in fact, our actual death. So it's a process as we're going through that our death is our entry into the Paschal mystery, into the resurrection, into the eighth day. So we're called out not to be yet another institution within the world's framework. You know, you've got this group, you've got that group, and you've got this group which calls itself the church. No, the church is the seed of the new creation already manifest in this world. And so ultimately, the church is the whole of creation seen eschatologically. Yeah, Could we the pause? Renewed creation. I want to take pause and repeat that definition. <laughs> the church is the whole of creation seen eschatologically. Uh, if I could uh, say how I understand this, and you correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm seeing all of creation eschatologically, I'm seeing the also, well, the imperfect, not yet also of our, the physical living, breathing members of the church, including myself, right? But I, if I'm seeing them, but also all of creation, whether, you know, beyond the walls of the church, I'm seeing it as a little bit of an open question because we don't see how mm -hmm. this is, how it will, this person, uh, this family and so forth will be fulfilled or not. Right. It's, it's because there's something called time right. and the historical reality of our very imperfect church being, right? If we constantly do our Pascha, our transition, this transitus, Passover from death to life, that I think is not once and for all done in baptism, that's just the spark, but you can't start a fire without a spark as Bruce Springsteen uh, has, has taught us. Um, we are, our Pascha, Christ, our new Pascha, in him, we're oftentimes dying various deaths, right? right. There are, we die many deaths, but we oh. also resurrect many resurrections, maybe mm. on a daily basis. And right. I feel like this, uh, you know, the icon of the resurrection, that's a Holy Saturday icon, when we're reaching out and he's He's, he's giving us a hand, but not without us making the effort to reach out. And he pulls us out of our ruts. And, right. and that's also the church in right. him, the, the help that we receive in communion. So to me, this underlining of, look, what if we as church right now are in a rut, right? But we're called out in that as we are in our personal ruts to, uh, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's hard to make that sometimes painful transition into him again. 
you know, yeah. to, to re-embrace him. That's all, yeah. Father John. Could you continue uh, this thought about what church is? Yeah, um, and I, I like the way you put that very, very much. Our struggle is constant, always. You know, the life of a Christian is simply one of taking up the cross or realizing uh, that the cross is given to us in, in our daily struggles, whether it's with each other, whether it's with our neighbours, you know, whatever it might be. We're, we're constantly struggling, we're constantly shedding skin to grow into the new life and all the rest of it. If you take that image of the, the church as being the whole of creation seen eschatologically, you're right, we don't, we don't see the end. We only see kind of anticipations of it. But the conviction is, and this is the conviction we live by, that through this whole process, God is bringing all things into subjection to Christ. Period. It's Corinthians 15. God is bringing all things into subjection to Christ. And we know that all things be brought to subjection because ultimately we all do die. You know, whatever comes to being in time passes away in time. We will all ultimately die. We're all brought into subjection so that Christ can bring all things into subjection to God so that God can be all in all. That's given. That's an apostolic proclamation. God will be all in all. Um, to talk then about the whole of creation seen eschatologically, well, we can't see that in the present, but we can see anticipations of it. While you were talking, another image came to my mind. Um, you know, the way that the world is dead in the middle of winter. And then as we come into spring, you start to see blades of green grass, new life bursting forth, you know, which gives us an anticipation of what the whole of that creation would be like in the height of summer or however you want to play the image. Yeah? So in a sense, that is what we are called to be, manifesting that new life which comes through the death of winter, through the death of taking up the cross, laying down our life so that we might gain our life, bearing life in that way, and that is uh, the, the creaking of the old creation as we are bringing life into this world, given the life given to us by Christ, bringing it in already. Yeah. This, um, this whole theme of dying and of suffering also, uh, because the separation, right, of, from the body is uh, painful for us, mm. uh, or someone else's physical death is painful for us and Jesus wept uh, mm -hmm. because he understood this, uh, that it's painful and sad. Um, I think that this brings us to another question I wanted to discuss. Before, with you, you. Be, before you do, before you go into that, though, can I just, well, I've really interrupted you, so I'm not going to ask you. All about right, that. go ahead and spoil <laughs> my whole <laughs> intro. Go ahead, go uh, ahead. That, that question of suffering, it is not, it, we, we, you know, the word suffering in English primarily has got a very, very negative connotation. It's feeling of pain and anguish and so on, yeah? But in Greek, it's much more embracive. Um, and it can include joy. So for me, one of the, my favourite psalm verses is from the Vestal Psalm, where we say, you take away their breath, they die, return to the dust, you send forth your spirit, and they are created. And notice that it goes, you take away their breath, they die, uh, return to the dust, the spirit is given and they live. It's a movement from death through to life. But that phrase, you take away their breath, I think it only works in English. I don't think it works in German, in Greek, in Hebrew, in French. Because in English, to take away your breath also means to be struck with awe, to be overwrought. My breath is taken away by the beauty that I see before me. It so, was breathtaking. It was, it was breathtaking. breathtaking. Right. Yeah, I don't think it works in any other language. Right. But well, we certainly, we certainly are stopped, uh, how do you say this in English, in our tracks by yeah. some of our rejections, losses, yeah. and sometimes maybe we only see it in hindsight, but we have to stop. And in that way, also say when we voluntarily take on, say, the Great Lent mm -hmm. or just Lent, as Carlos Tosuera pointed out to me, it's silly to say great Lent because there's only one Lent. <laughs> so <laughs> I always feel self-conscious using it. So when we take voluntarily take on uh, additional, say, uh, well, lament, lamentation that we have, say, during Lent, uh, we also take pause. Uh, the rhythm of our life slowed down. 
And yeah. so we're taking on this voluntary common ecclesial uh, lamentation. And I can see that, that the suffering is, uh, the, the weeping is joy creating. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I wanted to ask you about the sacrificial aspect of church unity, really, because unity does not come easily. And when we're united to Christ, we are, uh, you know, just like he is united to us in his death, the, the, the curtain in the temple is torn in two. And that, that rift between God and man is overcome by the shedding of his blood when he uh, overcomes all of the darkness and sin uh, of the world, the sins of the world. So I want to reflect together with you on this aspect of, yes, there is sacrifice. And today we might feel very much that we're called to a sacrifice known as martiria or witness by speaking out when perhaps it's not within our church, very PC. Uh, in some churches, it is very PC to be critical of the war. Uh, in my church, I don't have the feeling that it's very comfortable to be speaking out against Putinism, against the aggression against Ukraine and so forth. But I feel nonetheless that as church, we are called not just the bishops, uh, not even maybe perhaps not, not primarily the bishops. I think everybody is called, if you'll agree with me, Father John, when God says already in Isaiah, he says, uh, you be my witnesses. and I am your witness right, yeah. uh, says the Lord God, and then Christ says to the apostles that you will be my martyrs, martyrs, right, mm -hmm. but we read in the English, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and, mm -hmm. you know, all the way to the ends of the earth, so there's something inherently Christian about bearing painful, some of, oftentimes painful witness. It's not something unusual or something that is wrong with church being. It's supposed to be that way, you know? I mean, we have a church tradition that even glorifies saints like Saint Sophia with her three daughters, her three little girls of faith, hope, and charity that she's like, come along children, uh, die for Christ, you know? Nowadays, people say, you know, well, when it's a dangerous situation, especially if you have children, it's understandable that you should, you know, be quiet. I'm not saying I don't have children, right? And I'm, uh, I'm not easily saying, okay, we, we, you know, we put our children in harm's way. But I am saying that it's not unusual for the Christian vocation uh, that when it's hard, even when it's dangerous, we are very much called not to cease to bear witness to truth. Mm -hmm. And that's to, to you, Father John, I'll hand it over to you to speak to the sacrificial aspect of unity that we don't, you know, that we don't uh, embrace this vision of church as a very comfortable, maybe just a self-help program where it's so that you feel better or you make others feel better and you, uh, you know, to anyway, to speak to this more to this sacrificial aspect of unity. Oh, we come to the church today, simply. Uh, Irenaeus mean, speaks of the church as being the virgin mother who sends out a multitude of martyrs to the father. That's, that's what the church does. In the church, we learn to die to ourselves for the sake of our neighbor, for, for the kingdom, for the gospel, and all those other kind of things. A newly married, you talk about children, a newly married couple has a child. They bring it to the church. What does the priest do? He kills the child, yeah. sacramentally in baptism. You know, that's what we're asking him to do. Yeah, so the child can people who don't baptism. know what baptism looks like, he, Father John didn't mean that our <laughs> priest <laughs> kill our children. No, not in that, not in that sense. No, sacramentally, dunking sacramentally. them in water three times so that the spark might ignite, or, you know, as, you, as the language you used right. earlier. Absolutely. Uh, the, the trouble is when we start to think of the church primarily in horizontal terms, in worldly terms, as an organization within the world, 
alongside other socio-economic, political, whatever organizations. Yeah, then it becomes a means for our own whatever purposes it might be. No, we're called to bear witness to the life that is given to us by being the blades of grass that are spring up in the dead world. And Father John, uh, lest somebody think that we're talking about something very negative and perhaps even self-destructive, that you're, we're inviting you to die, <laughs> to somehow be perhaps downtrodden and, and uh, trampled and destroyed. Um, actually, what we're talking about is something very dignifying, this call to witness, to be orthodox, to uh, be upright about one's opinion, to straighten out your shoulders, stand up straight and be counted as one uh, witnessing to the truth of the church. To be a confessor means to be saying with someone else, right? To confess means to say together with someone else. With whom? With uh, the word of God. And to do that, uh, to be called to such responsibility, right? Each and every one of us, not just the bishops, but each and every one of us, we, in many ways, in our sitting back, I think, and being consumerist about the church. Like we come like consumers and we are to be served. And if we're not pleased, well, uh, we just leave and shop for uh, some other place. But don't we share responsibility? And by responsibility, um, uh, I mean very much the ability to respond to that call. As Father John mentioned, we are called out as church, as ecclesia, right, from ek kaleo, to call forth or to call out. We are called to be witnesses. And this dignifying responsibility and also accountability, right, because that's the whole business of the final judgment is being held accountable, not just getting, you know, participation trophies and 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 uh, being patted on the head, uh, uh, regardless, right? Uh, this is what I want to talk about: the positive aspect of what we expect. You know, at the end of the creed, we say "expecto resurrectionem mortuorum," right? Or "pros doho anastasi necron," or even "I yearn for something positive." right? That's in the Slavonic, in case uh, anybody out there didn't know. Um, it's, I yearn for something very positive. I don't expect doom and gloom at the end of it all as the eschaton. What I expect as a Christian is new life, new yeah. life. So totally. that's the point. Totally. It's to be witnesses to new life, to be the, as I suggested, the, the green shoots coming out in the deadness of this world. Right. To, totally to be there. And not only that, but you talk about confessing. You alluded to it earlier, but that verse from Isaiah is so striking. Be my witnesses, says God, for I am a witness and my servant whom I've called. He's invited, you know. Being that witness is to share in the divine life and to, to be gods. I say you are gods, yeah, right. sons of the most high. When, when we, I think when we're reflecting on the term church, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's, as I said, also a good time to reflect on orthodox because mm -hmm. oftentimes it's also a very reductionist what it means to be orthodox. It just means to be part of this elite club. Right. But when we uh, or, or when we say upright opinion or upright worship or praise, the, these are the usual definitions of orthodox. Right. But upright, you know, the way uh, those familiar with Jordan Peterson's work will know that in his 12 rules for life, one of the rules, I think it might even be the first rule. I forgot which rule it is, but it's sit up straight or straighten out your shoulders. And I think about you know, we hear in our liturgy, uh, say, Sophia Orthi, uh, you know, literally stand upright. Uh, I think that this uh, little secret to living a dignified life, as even this clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson would suggest, I think this is 
an important aspect of being orthodox, of sharing responsibility like an adult for the witness mm -hmm. and not having this reductionist sit back and wait to see how the bishop behaves, right? Because we abandon the bishop in that way when we cease to share the responsibility, I think. And, and we, there's been a lot of talk in Russia by, well, by the opposition mostly of, you know, people who do feel devastated by what is being done in the name of the Russian people. Not everybody feels that way, sadly, that it's, that it's a big shame for everybody. There's been a lot of discussion of what is, is there an idea of shared responsibility or is there idea of shared guilt or shared uh, culpability. And what, what has been interesting to me is to hear some of the wiser voices say, we have to distinguish between shared guilt or uh, I forgot how it is in Russian, but vina, vina is, is culpability or uh, yeah, guilt. Uh, it's not guilt, it's okay, anyway, let's go with culpability. Um, and, and shared responsibility on the other hand, because the responsibility is shared whether you like it or not, even say in the form of sanctions that will, that will affect eventually anyway, anyway everybody. Uh, and you know, the, 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 the kind of suspicion and negative opinion that perhaps many people in the world now have of Russians in general or of orthodoxy in general. So I want to talk about the fact that culpability, of course, is very concrete, and those, those who are culpable must be eventually judged and rendered harmless for the rest of the world. They must be brought to justice. That is the way uh, this has to work, because if everybody's culpable, then nobody is, um, and, and that's just uh, not right. Uh, but Shared responsibility, I think, forget about now the political or the national responsibility, and let's look at what I think is the shared responsibility of all of the Orthodox Church that is still in communion with uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. We have, an, I, because we have an idea that we can wash our hands and jump jurisdiction as if you've really gone anywhere. Uh, we're in communion and we share responsibility. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. This is a healing thing. And it's a time when, uh, you know, when they say the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. It's an uh, opportunity for us to uh, sit up straight and to be orthodox. This is the way I see it. And it's not a bad thing. You know, we might rediscover what it truly means to be church, to be orthodox and to have that dignifying sacrifice. Sacrifice means, everybody, if you don't know, from satser and facere, it means making holy, holy making. So this is our opportunity uh, to sacrifice through a painful word. So that I wanted to, to just explain that this is not doom and yes. gloom. Yes. No, I totally agree with you. When you make that distinction between culpability and responsibility, the thing that came to my mind was, was it Elder Zosima in the Brothers of Karamazov? You know, we are responsible before everybody for everything. <laughs> that is a basic stance for Christian, very different to culpability, you know? Um, but that being responsible before everyone for everything is kind of akin to recognizing oneself to be a sinner, which is, again, not a doom and gloom thing, but is, in fact, the prerequisite for being able to approach the cup of life. <clears throat> yeah, so those two, those two things are all bound up together. It's something I think that the Lord is expressing when he wills it that he be crucified in between <laughs> two hardened <laughs> criminals. Right. One of them is no longer hardened, but he's sharing responsibility with the worst <laughs> of the worst. Um, <laughs> And this enables him to, to receive, turn it inside out. Yes, and, and to receive the one that wants to recognize yeah. that sacrifice into paradise. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an interesting thing about 
the, t the difference between the terms responsibility and culpability that I think the distinction needs to be made in the whole business. This will take us down a rabbit hole, but I just wanna mention it. I don't think the distinction it can be made either in the Greek or in the Slavonic, as far as I know, when you when we talk about something like original sin, because mm -hmm. original sin is not about shared culpability, but it is about shared responsibility, right? right? <laughs> or can you think of a distinction? Because when sin using, I, I know it's actually not a term that's biblical. You know, I don't, I don't even think that the the fall is a biblical term, as far as I know. You know, we see it mm -hmm. as the fall, but it's not. So, what is it? Uh, it's is it a, a, a anyway? Uh, it's I think that might not be so relevant to our conversation. <laughs> we can go down that rabbit hole if you want to. Well, uh, why don't we? It'll, it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, the it'll thing be... I want to emphasize is that each and every one of us has fallen short of that to which we're called. Yeah, but it's through the process of growth that we arrive at that to which we're called. Right. Yeah, so the two, again, the two go together. And that process of growth to arrive at that to which we're called is one of struggle. But through that struggle, we learn, we grow, we become stronger, we become more attuned to the life that God gives us, and we can bear greater witness to others about it. Right. And of course, always in the spirit of the cross, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about, you know, pointing fingers or, uh, you know, somehow protesting something. With this whole conference, my dear viewers, uh, this whole conference is not about protesting something. It's about affirmation of who we are and uh, an expression of our desire in truth and in love to discuss and to witness uh, to the truth of this war and not to wash our hands and say, as many people are saying, I'll say it in Russian first, because it's it's a phrase that's become infamous uh, in the attitude towards this. This is all not clear. It's not clear where the truth is. You know, there's this side and this side. We don't know everything. And just like Pilate said, quid est veritas, right, and washed his hands, this is simply, it's actually been a, a strategy of the Kremlin propaganda to float different narratives of the rationalizations for the war. Uh, there's already several times the explanation of why this special operation happened. The story has changed, right? Even initially, there was this, we're not going to attack, we're not invading, uh, and then they attack anyway. So there's uh, this uh, deception going on, this smoke and mirrors, uh, but there is what we are being offered is a justification for inactivity because we can't know the truth. So we've been offered this agnosticism uh, as if that is a Christian option, but mm -hmm. we are also called out to discern within history, mm -hmm. we're constantly called to discern the truth because we believe differently from agnostics, that God does reveal himself to human beings in this world, right? And we are there to respond. We have responsibility to read the signs and to respond to the manifestation, the revelations of God and of th those who oppose him. So we can't wash our hands and then say, we sit back because we don't know where the truth is. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, and I think to take it back to a point you're raising, I think we got into a detour one way or the other, or many of them, however, um, to, to bring what you were just saying back to that point, uh, I think it's a crisis that we are in, which is really such a positive occasion, if we can turn it around that way. Please define crisis for us. Oh, crisis. Um, a moment of judgment, a moment of, of um, <laughs> crisis, that's how to put it, uh, a moment where we stand on the edge and we're faced with, you know, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. Um, Christ says, uh, Christ himself says, you know, when he's lift, with re reference to his being lifted up on the cross, now is the judgment of the world. Yeah. And the word there is crisis. Okay, now is the crisis of the world. Yeah. Well, in a sense, you could almost say now is the crisis of ecclesiology. 
now is a crisis of how it is we actually understand the church and what the church to be. Is it the kind of um, clericalized, hierarchalized institution that we were that we've come to think of it in so many ways as, or is it really the new life that's coming to us from the eschaton as we are born in the womb of our heavenly mother? Yes, I agree, Father John, and I'm so thankful that you could take us uh, deeper into the profound mystery that is church, that we rise to the occasion, sit up straight, and humbly, of course, uh, discern, you know, what are we called to do at this point, um, and how can we act responsibly, how can we speak responsibly, of course, um, with uh, with Christ in our midst and not without uh, being aware very much and in trepidation of mm -hmm. his presence. Okay, so everybody- well, you, I'm, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you once again, um, because the line you just finished with reminds me, which I'm going to talk about in my talk, about Christ in our midst, yeah? Um, and the, where I just left off about the clericalization of the church, the institutionalization, the hierarchalization of the church. Um, one of my favorite writers is St. Ignatius of Antioch, and he's always quoted as saying, where the bishop is, there is a church. I'm sure everybody's heard that, where the bishop is, there is a church. Whereas, in fact, what he says is, where the bishop is, let the people be present, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is a church. What we've tended to do is to miss out the people and to miss out Jesus Christ and draw an equation between the bishop and the church. That's not what St. Ignatius is saying. <laughs> Right. Thank you for reminding us of that, Father John. And thank you for being with us. Everybody, the the talk of Father John uh, is something that you can hear at the conference. It's known as the WOW conference because it's the Women's Orthodoxy and War Conference. So that's WOW conference. It's easier to remember that way. And we wanted to have a catchy title to attract not only you ladies out there, uh, but it will be mostly female speakers, not exclusively. Uh, and the panel will be mostly women, but not only. Uh, so check out the program at the link that will be provided either in this video or under the video on YouTube, all right? And do come one and all, if only you can manage it. It is a difficult time to, to come to go somewhere because it's Pentecost weekend, but it's Friday evening and Saturday morning until, well, until the early afternoon. So theoretically, maybe, um, you know, you can make it to the vigil, I hope, uh, for Pentecost on that Saturday on the eve of Pentecost. Um, and I think that because it happens to be the time also when I and other speakers will be able to be in New York. Uh, so we really didn't have another, uh, another weekend to do that. Uh, uh, anyway, please sign up. And I look forward to seeing those of you who can be there, but you could also participate via Zoom, but you do have to register. Father John, once again, my dear friend, thank you so much. Uh, for always uh, being so engaging and participating and being willing uh, to help us understand uh, these mysteries. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me yeah. to chat with you, Sister Vasa, and I'm sure the conference will definitely be wow. Will be wow. <laughs> okay, we will end on that. Uh, and I will see you whenever I make another video, my dear friends, or join us on patreon.com slash sistravasa, where I do uh, one podcast right now. I do one po audio podcast a week while I am writing a book about the liturgy of time or walking through time. That's it, everybody. Bye. <laughs>